Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis. Friends, I just have to say a big, huge thank you to the over 2,000 beautiful souls who attended Angel Fest this last week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, every day, uh, before and after I sent you emails about different angels, who they are, how they're working with you, how you can connect with them on a deeper level. Every day we went through and we had new interactions together, live events, we gave away so many prizes, gift cards, sessions, readings, just so many different things. And I'm so, so grateful for every single soul who attended. Friends, we're going to leave this open. So if you want access to this Angel Fest content, you can still get this for one week only. Go over to theangelmedium.com backslash free. And friends, the angel membership is only open until February 1st, and then we are closing the doors for the year to the angel membership. Friends, uh, Jen E. from Colorado said, I love that the angel membership has opened me to possibilities I thought I could only imagine or dream about. I started because I was searching for answers. The membership gave me a spiritual home based, helped me heal inner hurts, and gave me a way to connect with my loved ones and spirit team that I did not know was possible. I am so grateful spirit led me to Julie and allowed me to find faith, connection, and healing in my own way. Thank you, Jess E. from Colorado. I want this for you. I want this for everyone. In the angel membership, You have access to me being your spiritual coach weekly in our live groups, uh, events on Mondays. You have different live events every single month with healers on my team as well. Small groups, different group readings that we do together. Um, There's so much there for you. If you're a person who's going through a loss, there is a grief group for you in there to help you spiritually navigate that loss. We also have access. I give you access to almost all of my past courses. You get everything except for the Angel Reiki School. So it's a tremendous value for um, a monthly payment that you can make. If you want to join annually, that's awesome too. We give you perks when you join annually. All of that information is on my website. The link is in the show notes. It's theangelmedium.com and then go to the angel membership tab. Friends, I want this to be the best year of your life. And friends, here's what I'm going to say, regardless of whether or not you join the angel membership, I might be shooting myself in the foot here, but your angels are always working with you, right? They are always going to work with you. What the angel membership does is it takes years of you off of your life, of you having to research this or read all of these books. It's organized learning content for you to come in and really get to know exactly how to use your intuition. Trust that what you're hearing is your angels, guides, and loved ones and allow that information to guide you. Kelly from Texas put, the angel membership has helped me tremendously to trust, trust my intuition, how to communicate with my angels and guides, to trust the messages I'm receiving and my sense of knowing. That's what I want for you, friends. If you want help with this, I want this to be your best year yet. Go over to theangelmedium.com and join the angel membership today and I will be your spiritual coach all year long. Now, without further ado, here is today's interview with Steve Taylor. Hi, Steve. Welcome back to the show. Hi, Judy. Great to be with you again. Thank you so much. Got a copy of your new book here, The Adventure, A Practical Guide to Spiritual Awakening. I'm so excited to have you on to talk about it. You've written so many books that have just touched my life personally. What inspired you to write this one? It was, um, I'd always sort of liked the idea of, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm partly an academic. I'm a psychologist and I've studied spiritual awakening experiences for a long time i've had my own spiritual awakening experiences but for a long time i've had the uh, the idea to write a practical book you know what what i've learned myself about spiritual awakening 
and what I've learned from investigating other people's awakenings. I wanted to sort of put it all together into a very practical manual, a kind of step-by-step -step guide to awakening. And the other thing was that, you know, th through my research into spiritual awakening, I've identified a number of like common characteristics, a number of sort of core characteristics that spiritually awakened people have. So I, I feel that, you know, if we focus on these characteristics and we cultivate them, then that that in itself is a is a, a path of spiritual awakening. What are those eight qualifiers or qualities of wakefulness? And how did you decide uh, which ones you wanted to include in the book? Well, it, it, as I say, it came from my research. You know, I, I sp I've spent many years as a psychologist uh, interviewing and investigating cases of spiritual awakening. Most of the cases I've investigated are what I call transformation through turmoil. That's when people have a sudden dramatic spiritual awakening in the midst of deep turmoil. Sometimes happens, sometimes happens after a bereavement, after a diagnosis of cancer, after a period, a long period of depression or addiction and so on. Uh, so th th these characteristics kept occurring, you know, that spiritually awakened people keep, you know, mentioning these particular characteristics. They are very strongly developed in spiritually awakened people. So that's why I chose these eight characteristics. They are the eight most common or most prevalent characteristics in spiritually awakened people. Um, the first one is disidentification, which means that we no, no longer identify with our thought mind. We disidentify with the ego. Um, the second one is gratitude. Spiritually awakened people always have a, a very powerful sense of gratitude for all of the simple things and even for human life itself. They don't take anything for granted. They're, they live in a state of appreciation. And the third characteristic is presence, which means simply that spiritually awakened people have a very pronounced ability to, to be, to be in the moment, to exist in the world in the present moment. Uh, without being without thinking about the future or the past without thinking about thinking about anything just being present to the world and to their experience then there is altruism and i mean i think, I think everybody will, will understand that spiritually awakened people have a, a very strong um characteristic of altruism that's one of the defining characteristics of of spiritual awakening and the next one is acceptance um which means that spiritually awakened people have a uh, a pronounced ability to to accept everything that life's gi life gives them they don't live in resistance to reality they accept their life situation even whilst even whilst knowing that there may be some aspects of their life situation that they need to change they still accept it as it is in the moment the next one is integration which means integration with the body so that you know spiritually awakened people they treat their bodies with respect they cultivate their bodies, they exercise, they have a good diet. They're often vegetarians or vegans because they respect the body. And then there's, um, I think the seventh characteristic, you're testing my memory here with all these characteristics, but the seventh is detachment, which is spiritually awakened people don't depend on external things to make them happy or to give them a sense of identity. They don't depend on things like ambitions, or roles in society or possessions or status or success they don't depend on any of these external things for the well-being of their identity and finally the last characteristic i mention in the book and which i try to cultivate is embracing mortality uh, and that means that spiritually awakened people usually have a, a, a kind of accept an attitude of acceptance towards their own mortality they accept the fact that this life, this physical body is temporary. They accept the fact that life is fragile. And they, then they, they're happy to contemplate death because they, death gives them a sense of meaning. It gives them a sense of purpose. And also they often have a sense that this physical body is not the only, is not the be and end all of our existence. They, they sense that something inside them will continue once this physical, uh, this body, this physical body dissolves away. Amazing. Amazing. I wonder in your research, as you were looking at so many different people who um, have experienced a spiritual awakening, uh, and you've worked with so many teachers as well, and really world-renowned teachers uh, within our time, 
are, th- are there any differences between these qualities within the teachers and everyday people? Not really. I mean, once somebody is spiritually awakened, you know, that they, they share the same characteristics. It's like a, a landscape. Once you enter the landscape, it's the same landscape for everybody. But sometimes yeah. people emphasize different aspects of the landscape. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, they 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 observe certain features more strongly than others from their perspective. But I think the only difference is that teachers also have the ability to guide others through the landscape, which is really what the role of a teacher is. You know, spiritual the landscape of spiritual awakening, you know, is 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 terra incognita for most people. It's unfamiliar. It's kind of like sometimes difficult to acclimatize to it because it's a very rarefied environment, very unfamiliar. So the role of a spiritual teacher is to acclimatize people to this landscape and to guide them them through it. So I, I guess that's that's the the only difference really. I like that answer because I wanted people to hear because I wanted people to hear that there is no difference. You know, uh, there's people who say, you know, I don't want to be your guru. I don't want to be, you know, seen as that. There is no difference. And and I think that the more and more we can communicate that message, the better off humanity is. I think so. I mean, I, I when I was younger, I used to think that enlightenment was something really extraordinary and really rare, and that maybe there were only a few enlightened people in the world, and they were probably living in India, in ashrams, or maybe in Tibet, in, in monasteries. But I don't think it's like that at all. You know, it, it, as I've grown older, I've, I've come to realize that enlightenment or wakefulness is is actually not so uncommon. You know, there, mm-hmm. there are lots of people in our midst who, who are spiritually awakened. Maybe people who don't know anything about spirituality in a traditional sense, but as they live their lives, they are in, in a state of, of wakefulness. And like I said earlier, it's often people who have been through intense psychological turmoil and have undergone a shift as a result. In your studies, has it, it been looked at by you or anyone else um, where people have come into an awakening, but then shifted out of it after a time or have you found that once people really come into a awake- awakening they really do stay in it it depends on the on the strength of the awakening and usually people do well you know once they it's, again it's the, the metaphor of the landscape once you enter this landscape you don't leave it you know it, be, it becomes your home it's like sort of crossing over into a different continent and once you're there you you stay there for, for the rest of your life but if if the awakening isn't full, if it's not kind of hasn't fully manifested itself, then it may dissolve away. It may fade away after a short while. And uh, another variation is sometimes people repress their awakenings because they don't really understand what's happened to them. And it kind of conflicts with their view of reality. If they're brought up in a very secular, a very kind of scientific environment, they may undergo, undergo an awakening and think, wow, this doesn't make sense. Or even subconsciously, they may think, this doesn't make sense. You know, I don't really want this because it, it conflicts with my reality. So I'll keep it to the back of my mind. Um, so people sometimes, that, that sometimes happens. But because the shift is so fundamental and so powerful, you, you can't repress it forever. You can only repress it for a short time because it, it will always burst through. And um, so that, that sometimes happens. Do you think that the soul has its own unique personality? I I do. I think we all have our kind of social selves. We all have a kind of conditioned self that we develop to function in our societies. And, and, you know, in many cases, that's, you know, you need need to develop some kind of social self to function in in the everyday world. But the trick is to make your social self, I mean, your social self doesn't have to be inauthentic if it's aligned with your true authentic self. Mm-hmm. So I think the trick is really to, to develop a, a, a social self, a superficial self, which is a manifestation of your deep authentic self. I think that's where people get tripped up a lot of times is that they they feel like when they come into spiritual awakening, it's that they have to just live in this alter reality or alter vibration or um, the now 100% and that all of who they are just kind of has to dissipate, you know, into thin air. And mm. And yeah, I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I think you're right. 
and and um but i think people realize though that you know you have to even you know even if you've undergone a spiritual awakening you still have to live in the world mm -hmm. and you still have to have relationships in many cases you still have to earn a living and deal with the practical tasks of everyday life you've got to drive a car you've got to wash the dishes and, and so forth um, and sometimes you know, when, when you when you undergo a dramatic explosive awakening it can be difficult to function in that way you know in some way in some cases you have to relearn those skills it's a bit like being reborn you know you know a baby or a child has to learn to function in the world and it's the same after spiritual awakening you, you you're reborn as a new self and you have to relearn a lot of the essential survival skills but those but relearning those skills does not entail any diminishing in your awake in your awakening you mm -hmm. know a bit like we said earlier you can function perfectly in the world in a state of wakefulness you can do all of the practical things that life involves in fact in most cases people actually become better at doing those things they become more efficient they think more clearly uh, their relationships become more authentic uh, they become better at their jobs because they're more empathic and more understanding of others so i think uh, most people find that eventually even even after a period of of uh, integration or, or even after a period of confusion once it all settles down they switch into a higher functioning self yeah. And you talk a lot about disidentification with the thinking mind um, and how that's one of the most important initial steps in awakening. And, and that's, I think, where sometimes some of that like clash happens, because from my perspective, what's happening at that time as you're going through a natural awakening is you're really disassociating from the parts of you that were kind of lying to yourself all along. Um, that egoic mind piece that isn't associated with the soul or what the soul really wants to accomplish in this lifetime. So there's all these different pieces of us that maybe are trying to people please in some ways or be this or go after this in life that really aren't authentic to ourself at mm. all. And we, we really start to release. Um, how does that tie into your, uh, how you think about disidentification and, and maybe, so I'm not putting words in your mouth. Like, how do you think about disidentification? Hmm. Well, you know, as we mentioned earlier, we develop a kind of, in many cases, people develop a kind of false superficial self, which helps them to function in the world. In many cases, it's made up of conditioned ideas that they've inherited from people, from their culture, maybe from religious beliefs or other beliefs. And it's also based on thought patterns, which which have become established over time. You know, thought patterns about how, um, in terms of how people view themselves and how they view reality. Some people may have kind of negative thought scripts which run through their mind with causing a low self sense of low self-esteem or they may have scripts about, you know, feeling that the past they've been betrayed by people or that the world has kind of, they've been done wrong by the world, things like that. So all, the, all of this stuff creates a, a false identity in our minds. And just, just a constant stream, most people have a constant stream of thinking that passes through their consciousness. And that, that also constitutes, that's kind of like the surface activity of the ego, it's like the waves on the surface of the ego. I think there are some sort of more deep-rooted, patterns and scripts but on the surface there is this constant thought chatter so we end up thinking that this is who we are we end up completely identifying with this false superficial self and you know that's what that's why for some people meditation is a, is a revelation you know if you there was there's there's one guy i mentioned in one of my previous books in one of my book extraordinary awakenings there was a a soldier an ex-soldier who was living in a a state of trauma because he'd been through lots of painful experiences on the battlefield. He constantly, they were constantly sort of flashing or play, replaying in his mind. And he was in a constant state of misery because of these experiences. And but somebody, somebody told him or suggested it would be helpful for him to go to a Buddhist monastery to go on a meditation course. So he was sitting there meditating, and after about an hour, his thoughts stopped, and there was just a, there were a few seconds of clarity when he realized. I am not my mind. I am not my thoughts. I don't have to think these thoughts. These thoughts are making me miserable. Mm 
he, he realized all of these things in, in a few seconds. So it was a moment of disidentification from, from the thought mind. So that that's one of the great things that meditation can bring. And when people undergo spiritual awakening, even if their minds don't become quiet, you know, it's a it's a bit of a myth, I think, that spiritually awakened people don't think. They do think, but they don't usually think as much as other people. Their minds are normally quieter than other people. But the most important thing is that they don't identify with their thoughts. They think, oh no, that's a, that's another stupid thought. Why am I thinking these stupid thoughts? They can watch their thoughts pass by without identifying or attaching themselves to them. So that's really important. That, that in itself, that's a kind of freedom when you realize, when you step back and realize that you are not your thoughts. It is. It's so freeing and so liberating because so often times I think mainstream media here in the U.S. makes it appear as though enlightenment or awakening or becoming spiritual is you leaving who you are to just be in this nothingness. Mm. But really, it's a shedding of this layer that hasn't been you all along. And coming into this most beautiful essence of yeah. who you are as a divine being. Yeah, exactly. It's becoming more authentically you. Yeah. It's uncovering your essential self, which has been obscured by your ego self. And it means almost as if um, in, in many people, when they undergo a sudden awakening, it is as if there is a kind of latent or kind of essential spiritual self, which has been obscured all the time. It was always there. It was just waiting for the opportunity to manifest itself. But the old superficial ego has to dissolve away in order for that deeper self to manifest itself. So, so it, you know, it appears as though a new self is being born in these moments, but it's actually your most essential, most authentic self, which is being, which is being released inside you. One of the things too, yes, and one of the things that I love, love, love about your work is that um, you make it so much easier for people to believe that they can actually do the work to awaken before having to go through an intense life tragedy that brings them to that point. Um, what in your research have you found if, if a person hasn't gone through a loss or a health issue, what is the most impactful in bringing people home to their soul self through that awakening? Mm, yeah, as, as you say, you know, I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in my roles as psychology investigating these sudden spiritual awakenings that arise through turmoil and trauma. But yeah, that, that's certainly not the only way in which spiritual awakening manifests itself. I think for most people, it does manifest itself in a very gradual and integrated way over a long period of time through following certain practices and, and paths. And I mean, I think that one of the great things about living in the, what are we now, the 21st century? It's one of the great things is that there are so many paths open to us. If you were born in, if we'd been born 100 years ago, we'd maybe know about Christian spiritual paths, maybe about Christian mystics. But we wouldn't know about all of the other paths around the world, you know, like the, the Buddhist paths, um, you know, the paths of yoga and Vedanta, Taoism, Sufism. None of these paths would be ac accessible to us. But all of these, uh, they're all different paths of awakening. Every spiritual tradition maps out a path of spiritual awakening. Sometimes it involves accepting certain metaphysical beliefs, which you may not be comfortable with. But but you but, but once you commit to a path, then you know, it will inevitably bring awakening. I mean, so every spiritual path is is very detailed. It's been tested over cent many centuries. And that's why some, like the Buddhist path or the path of Vedanta, they're very methodical and psychologically very astute. So that's that's one possibility, simply committing to the spiritual path which suits you best. And uh, yeah, as, as uh, the main thing is that because there are so many paths accessible to us, we can choose the one which best suits our personality or our attributes uh, or, or our beliefs um, or our metaphysical worldview. But there are, a lot, there are lots of individual uh, lifestyle choices that we can follow, individual exercises or strategies we can follow. Um, like altruism, for example, is, is a great strategy of a method of spiritual awakening. You know, and, and that's why it features so heavily in spiritual traditions around the world. So for just, those... sorry. 
Oh, no, 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 uh, not to interrupt. For those who don't know what altruism is, because you mentioned that as one of the um, eight at the very beginning, uh, explain what that means. Altruism literally means otherism. Altra is the, the Latin word for other. So it means living for others, basically. So um, essentially it means kindness, generosity, benevolence, service. Um, it means acting selflessly, for the benefit of others amazing so, so it, it, that's a natural manifestation of spiritual awakening which is why i include it in the book but it's also a practice in itself you know you, you can undergo spiritual awakening through living in a in a consciously altruistic way amazing um okay you talk about in the book the taking for granted syndrome and uh can you talk about that and how we can overcome it the taking for granted syndrome is one of the essential human problems, uh, or well, I don't really like the word problems. That's called human issues, <laughs> because there are no problems; it's just situations that we need to resolve. Um, so, yeah, well, one of the essential issues of human beings is that we we so easily take things for granted. You know, it's like a good example is you 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 fall in love with somebody, you think they're going to be your perfect partner, you think your life will be perfect when you when you're living with them. And it's like that for a few weeks, maybe a few months, but after a while, after a few months, it's like, mm, you're kind of back back in reality. Life is not so different to it the way it was before. Maybe it's better, slightly better, but it's not as perfect as you thought. And that's partly because you know, you, you take your new life for granted. You take you you start to take your new partner for granted. It's the same, you know, for health. You know, we we tend to take our health for granted. If you have a serious brush with mortality, if you have a, an operation or serious condition, then you then you recover and think, wow. I'm so lucky to have this healthy body. I'm so lucky that my body is functioning properly and sustaining my life. But again, it doesn't last for a long time. After a few weeks, you start to take your body for granted again. It's the same with life itself. If you have a close brush with death, you think, wow, life is just so miraculous. I'm so lucky just to be alive. You know, I don't care about anything. I don't care what happens in my life. I'm just so lucky to be in this body, in this world, in this moment. But again, it doesn't last for a long time. So that, this is the taking for granted syndrome. But one of one of the things about awakened people is that they don't suffer from this syndrome. It, it's just absent. Uh, it doesn't function in their minds. So they live in a constant state of appreciation. They appreciate the miracle of their bodies sustaining their lives. They appreciate the wonderful people in their lives without taking them for granted. They appreciate their social conditions. If they if they're lucky enough to live in a society which is affluent or peaceful, free if they're free from oppression or injustice, they appreciate all of these things. And and life itself, you know, they appreciate the, you know, even if they sense that this life may not be the only life, they still appreciate the miracle of being in this body for a certain amount of time in this world. Side tangent over here, maybe you could help me with this. There's so much great work within the world of just so many different teachers and, and writings. Um, I find as a 42-year-old woman who works with a, just a ton of women who um, have families or are running businesses and, and just doing an immense amount of things that there's women going through a spiritual awakening, but almost feeling like they're not because they're managing so much within their lives. And I'm wondering, like with your work, have you seen that within busy moms? Like does awakening sometimes look different. And I know that we live in this society where men are helping more than ever before. Um, but this is something that I'm going to start to talk about on the podcast. There's just this mental weight to how much women have to do. And I was talking mm. with um, my counselor the other day. She's like, Julie, you know, what are the three things to getting anything done? You have to create a vision for it. You have to plan for it. You have to execute it. She goes, what are the two that take up the most mental space and energy? She goes, it's, it's visioning and planning. And, um, women are doing so much of that 
and it's just not taken into account, whether it's like planning the vacations or putting on holidays Mm. still. Um, And I'm just wondering if you can speak to all of them or if you've seen that within your own work, Mm. that they're really doing the best that they can. They are in that energy. And yet life is just really complicated and there's a lot going on. Yeah, I, I can, well, you know, I can identify that to an extent. I've got three kids and they're teenagers now, but it was really tough, especially for my wife. Also for me, when they were, and it, you know, it's really difficult when your kids are really young and you're working at the same time and trying to keep on top of things. And I, I think women, especially, are conditioned in our society to to put others before themselves, to kind of sacrifice themselves for the for the good of others, which in itself, you know, that that's altruism. So in itself, that's a spiritual practice. And I think it, it does bear th- fruit eventually. You know, it, it may not seem like it is, but if you're busy running around and your life is really stressful, dealing with the demands of parenting and working, it's, it's very stressful. But it is, it is a spiritual practice which will bear, bear fruit and is bearing fruit. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, interestingly, most of the people I speak to who undergo spiritual awakenings are female, you know. I I, I worked out in, one, in one, of, one of my research studies that two-thirds of the people I interviewed who had the spiritual awakenings were, were female. So it does seem to be more common in women. Um, you know, whether that's because women are more likely to come forward and report their experiences, I don't think it's just that. I think I think it is actually more common in women. And maybe, perhaps it is because women do tend to be more altruistic they do tend to live more selflessly, and as I say, that's a, a spiritual practice. But also, I think I think women. Are, um, this is a big generalization, of course, but I think there is there is something about the kind of the the female psyche which is less bounded than the male psyche. You know, it's kind of like the stereotype of the male ego, which is kind of very solid and very strong and very shut off. Whereas in general, the female ego tends to be more connected, less separate. So maybe maybe that's why there was a strong, stronger tendency for awakening. I've also just just one more thing. I, I found that I found many cases of women who undergo awakenings as young mothers because of the the terrible stress of new you know being a new mother. It's so stressful, um, such a difficult time when you're not sleeping as well, um, and you're so tired from nights of sleeplessness. You're so stressed out that that in itself can be a trigger for a very sudden explosive awakening interesting so when you were talking beginning uh, about the different landscapes and the eight that you mentioned <clears throat> you know when these women are just feeling overwhelmed and so busy and i don't have time for a, a deep meditation 30 minutes every day maybe them focusing on their landscape being that altruism can really help a woman come back in um, to feel more confident in her own spiritual practice, like don't have to do it all. Um, I'm doing yeah. enough right here and right now. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a good approach. But one of the things that I want to get across in the book is that spiritual practice does not have to be divorced from everyday life. It doesn't have to be something that you set aside as a special time in your life. It can perm- permeate your life. You can be spiritual in everything you do. And um, so th- I think that 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 attitude will help people who are, are so busy that they don't have time to sit down and meditate. They can bring a sense of spiritual practice into their daily lives. And mindfulness is, is a good example. You can be mindful in any action, in any activity in your life. Whatever you do, you can make a, a conscious, conscious effort to shift into the present moment and give your full attention to your experience and your surroundings in that moment. And as you say, altruism is also a good example. You, if you are living in that selfless environment, in that selfless way, you know, be, you should be conscious that it is a spiritual practice. And even when you, you're undergoing challenge and crisis in your life, that is a spiritual practice too. In fact, that is in some ways the best spiritual practice because it leads to so much, you know, crises and challenge uh, is, is, is such, a, such a fertile ground for spiritual growth, even if you're not aware of it at the time. 
Yeah, that's so interesting. I've been thinking about that a lot lately, that um, there tends to be sometimes when it's not grief or a health issue, uh, but you're going through major life challenges, we tend to think, well, what am I doing wrong? right? Like what, what am I doing wrong? And yet on the same side, we don't want to see that we're doing anything wrong because then we feel this shame. And a lot of us, we just don't want to, we'll do anything to not feel that shame. Um, how do you work through that piece of allowing yourself to be human and not shaming yourself, but understanding that we make mistakes and and really coming home to the truth of just allowing it to be what it is. That's, um, it's a question of acceptance, you know, uh, acceptance is certainly one of the most important qualities and, and one of the qualities which naturally arise in, in spiritual awakening. And, you know, when, when we're dissatisfied with ourselves or when we are dissatisfied with our lives, it means that we are resisting the the reality of ourselves and our predicament. It doesn't mean that we we have to you know we have to remain the same or that our lives have to remain the same because acceptance is often the first stage in changing your life. But you have to be in a mode of acceptance where you 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 are completely open to your to your situation and to your personality and the events that are happening in your life. And again, the emotions like guilt or regret they are also emotions that arise from resistance. You know, if you, if you accept your past, and really you have no choice but to accept your past because you can't change it, then then you let go of these emotions, which are you know completely futile emotions because, you know, if they're if they're based on the past, there's nothing you can do to alter it. So yeah, it's really it's really to do with an attitude of acknowledgement and openness and acceptance towards the reality of your life. How did you? come or or are there any examples over the last year where you're still coming into acceptance of different parts of yourself or how does that still happen um for you you know if i if, if i'm being honest <laughs> yeah the well the aging process i'm i'm 56 now and i am aware of certain changes like you know you may not notice it but there's a quite a large ball spot on my head <laughs> Um, I'm starting to go grey, and you know, uh, I'm starting to you know put on a bit of weight. So I'm 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 very aware of the aging process, and you know, it, obviously it's irreversible. So I'm I'm becoming aware of the irreversibility of the process, and also the fact that it, it's the aging process is really just an indication that we are mortal beings. We are, we are undergoing this process. We are flowing through the journey of life toward ultimately towards dissolution. Um, so, you know, I, I don't struggle greatly with it, but I'm aware of it. And I occasionally, I occasionally look at my ball spot and think, oh, that's not going to go away. <laughs> I'm not going to get that hair back. Um, but yeah, obviously, obviously in our society, a lot of people are primed not to accept, to resist the aging process. You know, we're, we're primed to try and look as young and attractive as possible. And in itself, there's nothing wrong with that, but. You know, if it's based on an attitude of resistance to towards the aging process, then that's not healthy because no no attitude of resist resistance is healthy. You'd always create some degree of duality, you know, because you're opposing the reality of your life. It creates conflict because you're opposing the reality of your life. Mm -hmm. I was just talking about this with a counselor uh, last summer, about six months ago, because uh, I'm 42 and I'm starting to see the wrinkles and I'm starting to see this and a little bit of like creepy neck skin over here. And um, so I just had one of those days, you know, when you just don't know what you're going to talk about with your counselor, but you go in and you're like, oh, okay, there's something there. <laughs> um, and she goes, wow, well, it does take courage, you know, to, to grow older and, and accept that new part of you. And I had never even considered that before. Yeah. Yeah. Accepting new part of you. I, I like that. And it's interesting that in other societies around the world, you know, wrinkles are taken as, as a sign of wisdom. They're not something to be repressed or hidden. They're, they're a sign that you are wise, that you've, you've lived and you've gained experience. Yeah. I, I like that. We're going to call them wisdom wrinkles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's, it's, I like the idea. One of my poems, I write about the 
the autumn of, you know, when you're young, you have this kind of dazzling radiance about you. This kind of, uh, you know, kind of, it's kind of, kind of a very bright attractiveness or physical lightness about you. But when you're older, that brightness, it doesn't fade away. It matures into a kind of a, a mature autumn light, a very rich light, a rich and deep light. That's the kind of light you radiate when you're older, this kind of mature richness with wisdom. Yeah. So it's, it's a different kind of light, but it's uh, it's a more powerful light. A depth. There feels like there's like a depth to it. Yeah. Yeah. I that's like that's that. right. Yeah. One of the things I want to talk about too is in your book, you talk about the role our body plays in awakening and really cultivating a better relationship with our physical form. And I just wonder if you can explain that to folks and and really what you've learned along the way about that. There's sometimes an assumption, I guess this is one of the myths about spiritual awakening. There's sometimes an assumption that enlightened or awakened people you know, they, they separate from their bodies, they become detached from their bodies. I guess it comes from the old idea, which is quite strong in some Christ Christian traditions, that the body is a kind of enemy, it's full of these unclean desires that we need to transcend, you know, the body is a kind of animal, it's kind of this, this machine that we, we happen to be imprisoned in, but we're not really bo our body, we are a soul and the soul is separate to the body. The soul needs to become free of the body. But I, that, that's quite an unhealthy attitude because it does lead to sexual repression. It leads to mistreatment of the body um, and so forth. It leads to the kind of asceticism, which is some early Christians practice when they stand on top of towers and, you know, wear hair shirts and beat themselves and so forth. But on, on the contrary, I have found in my, my research that spiritually awakened people do not separate from their bodies. They become more integrated with their bodies. They realize that the body, well, on the one hand, they realize that the body is miraculous because of all the millions of processes that take place to keep them alive. They, they, but they also realize that the body is, is part of the soul. The body is not apart from spirit. The body is infused with spirit. The body is a, a manifestation of spirit. And, it, and therefore it's sacred, just as the world is sacred. Um, and that's why spiritually awakened people in almost every case that they they take care of their bodies they they usually shift into a much more po positive attitude to the body they start to eat much better i mean this, this happened to me I, I used to have a terrible diet i never cared about food at all until i was 29 and i sort of underwent my spiritual shift but before that i just eat, I, I used to eat junk food the most terrible food all the time and i never exercised i used to smoke a lot and drink and and so forth. So I was quite unhealthy. But as soon as I underwent my my shift, you know, I became a vegetarian, my diet became much better. I started to exercise, I started to do yoga. And that's because, you know, I I was aware of the, the preciousness and the sacredness of the body. Yeah. And um it's interesting because I went through my spiritual awakening in 2015, although going through that, I just didn't realize how in tune I was beforehand to so much uh, coming through. Um, but I, it's taken me since 2015 till now about eight years to really focus in on the food and the exercise. And I've tried various different things along the way, but I just got into Pilates and it's oh, yeah. so interesting to see how it shifts the energy of the body and how much more open um, just everything feels. And it feels mm. so good to feel good in the body. Yeah, that's right. After awakenings, people do become more sensitive to the body. You know, they, they become more alive in the body. And therefore, that's one of the reasons why they, they often become vegetarians because they they feel the impurity of certain foods that in general they they tend to eat in a much more healthy way because they can feel their body sensitivity to certain foods and also yeah. that's why they they often stop drinking or smoking because they you know and again it's a question of sensitivity and yeah i think in general people do become aware that it's, it's great to be in the body to be in a healthy body and to feel you know the the energy flowing through your body, you know, and I, I, I do yoga. I, I get that from yoga. I've never tried Pilates, but I guess it's a, 
a similar kind of thing. Yeah, I actually started Pilates because I have really bad acid reflux. And with doing yoga and reflux, it's not a great combination. Um, it kind of exasperates the the reflux, but the Pilates doesn't. It really calms it. Oh, ah, right. Have you tried any of the, the Chinese exercises like the, the uh, Qigong or... No, but I really want to. I think that those would be wonderful. And they seem like they really open you as well. Yeah, they're, they're very energetic. They're very soft and, and subtle, but very uh, based on, you know, the chi the energy within our bodies. So that, yeah, they're, they're, they're great too. I love that. I love that. Um, at the end of the book, you say that we really never reach this point of complete wakefulness. How so? I think that, that's another uh, of the myths about awakening. The, the, there is a certain end point where you think, ah, I'm here. I'm spiritually awakened. Now I can relax. <laughs> <laughs> There's nowhere else to go. I've got to the end of the, I've climbed, I've reached the peak of the mountain. Now I can just look around and take in the view. Um, but no, that, that's not the case that there is no end point. At least, um, you know, that's my impression from the pe people I've interviewed and my own experiences. I actually met one, the most spiritually awakened people I've ever met. Sorry, the, one of the most spiritually awakened people I've ever met. Uh, who I mentioned in the book is a guy called Russell Williams, who died a few years ago. He was a spiritual teacher here in England, not particularly well known because he he was never interested in sort of publicizing or promoting himself. So, you know, he never became particularly well known. But he he died at the age of 96. And I, I helped him write a book about his life and his teachings. And he said that he told me when he was 91 that, you know, he underwent his awakening at the age of 29 after a lot of trauma. And he was in the Second World War and Lots. He was at Dunkirk and went through lots of trauma. Um, but anyway, at the age of 91, after 60 plus years of, of wakefulness, he said to me, it's great because I'm still discovering new things. You know, it's like an endless adventure. I keep going deeper and I, I keep discovering more and more and it's endless. And I, I think that's true. I think there's never any end to the journey. Again, it's if we go back to the metaphor of the landscape, once we enter this landscape, it doesn't. There's not a kind of wall where it ends. It just keeps moving onwards. We keep moving onwards, and exploring more and more of the landscape. Usually, there's a, a process of deepening and expanding, and we, you know, there's no end to it. We keep expanding infinitely. We keep going deeper and deeper in an infinite way. Um, it's interesting. I've been saying at this on the podcast and I, I wrote it in my second book that I just wrote last year, uh, but it hasn't come out yet, but I was watching a Netflix, um, something or other show and they had scientists on, they were talking about infinity. And before I watched that show, I had only thought about there being one infinity, but the mathematicians on there said there are infinite infinities. And as they they said that, I audibly heard every soul is its own infinity. And I thought that's fascinating that we're here to explore the infinite mm. being that we are and that infinity I understand it correctly just keeps going and going and going mm, that's interesting yeah yeah it's a bit like the idea that you know does the universe have an end point or does it stretch on forever and you, you can't really imagine that the universe has a, an end point where you, you reach the end of the universe and it's like this wall which you can't go beyond obviously the universe it makes more sense to think it is infinite it stretches on forever and I think that's a good metaphor for the landscape of spiritual awakening, which stretches on forever. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Is there anything else that you're feeling called to share or anything else that you hoped uh, the listeners would take away today? I'd like to maybe emphasize the point, a point we made earlier that spiritual awakening is not a rare an extraordinary state, which is only accessible to monks and mystics and, you know, long-term meditators. It's accessible accessible to every everybody. Um, you know, we can all embark on a, on a journey of awakening right now. And that's, you know, the book is a kind of guidebook to that journey. But but I think the reason why we can all undertake this, undertake this journey is because it's our most essential state. I think we all have an essential self or soul 
which exists in a naturally awakened state. It's just covered over by our social conditioning and by our superficial egos. So we need to slowly uncover this naturally awakened self and allow it to manifest itself in the world and in our lives. I love it. I love it. For those who are watching on YouTube, it's called The Adventurer, A Practical Guide to Spiritual Awakening by Steve Taylor. I have read almost all of Steve's book, I think, because there's so many out there. And um, I just love his work. I know that you'll love it too. Thank you, Steve, so much for being here and blessing us with your time. Thank you. It's been lovely to talk to you. Friends, let's end today's episode with a prayer. Dear God, as we stand here at the threshold of a new year, we come to you humble in gratitude and hopeful in our hearts. We ask you to bless this world and every person in it with your endless love and abundance. We call upon your angels to extend their wings over every soul. May they touch every life, bringing healing where there is pain, strength where there is weakness, and infinite abundance in every area of every life. In this time of global reflection and anticipation, we pray earnestly for peace, peace within our own hearts, peace within our homes, peace across every land. Let hope rise and let love prevail, binding us in our shared humanity and interconnectedness. We ask for special care and protection for the children of our world. May they grow in a nurturing environment, shielded from harm and surrounded by care. Their laughter and their dreams are the seeds of a promising future. And we ask that each are blessed with every opportunity to thrive. God, guide us to be creators of our own harmonious world. Help us to become beacons of your energy and spread your love now and always. As we step into this next chapter of our lives, empower us to live in alignment with our soul. Find joy in each moment and embrace the beauty of life's journey. May we each walk in confidence and faith, knowing that with your divine guidance, anything is possible. May our hearts overflow with gratitude and our minds be filled with positive, loving thoughts. In this spirit of optimism and renewal, we step boldly into our future, ready to create, love, and thrive. In this we pray, amen. Friends, if you'd like to support this podcast, book a session with me or join my Angel Reiki School, where I'll help you develop all of your unique spiritual gifts and use them to serve. Visit theangelmedium.com or use the link in the show notes to book a discovery call with me personally. Thank you for being here. I love you.